Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Gary Michael Hilton? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the murders, then offer my analysis. Gary Michael Hilton was born on November 22, 1946, in Atlanta, Georgia. His father and mother divorced when he was young, and his mother remarried. The family moved to Hialeah, Florida in 1958. In 1959, Gary retrieved a firearm and shot his stepfather. The gunshot wound was not fatal. His stepfather declined to file charges. Gary ended up spending some time in a mental health facility, mostly because of the shooting part. In 1964, Gary enlisted in the United States Army and spent some time in Germany. He was honorably discharged in 1967 after having symptoms of schizophrenia. In 1969, Gary married for the first time. He and his wife divorced in 1971. In 1973, Gary was convicted of DUI. He married for a second time in 1977, divorcing in 1978. His third and final marriage started in 1979 and ended that same year. In 1982, Gary was arrested for arson. In 1983, he was convicted in the state of Georgia for possession of drugs and carrying a gun without a license. In 1987, he was charged with theft by deception and possession of marijuana. As far as how Gary made a living, he would call people and ask for charitable donations only to put the money in his pocket. For this phone scam, he was charged with 21 counts of solicitation in 1994. As with all his crimes up to this point, Gary only suffered minimal consequences. He only had to serve probation for these charges. 1995 was a big year for Gary. He was charged with theft on two occasions and consulted on a low-budget movie. In 1997, Gary found a job selling siding and had the job for 10 years before being terminated. Now moving to the timeline of the murders. On October 21, 2007, an 80-year-old man named John Bryant and his 84-year-old wife Irene drove their maroon Ford Escape to the Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina. The couple went for a hike, but never returned. Family members reported them missing two weeks later. The Ford Escape was located by the police in the forest, but there was no sign of the couple. Data from the Ford indicated that the vehicle had last been running at 1.59 p.m. on October 21. Investigators learned that John's cell phone was used to call 911 that same day at 3.59 p.m., but the call did not progress past the nearest cell tower. After searching extensively for the couple, the police found Irene's body on November 10, in the forest just 150 feet away from the Ford Escape. She had been beaten to death with a blunt object. The police did not think it was likely that her husband John was the perpetrator. Rather, he had probably been kidnapped by the killer. On October 22, John's bank card was used in Ducktown, Tennessee to withdraw $300 from an ATM. In surveillance video, a man wearing a yellow rain jacket could be seen making the withdrawal. Investigators were not able to identify who the perpetrator was because his face was covered, but based on the size of his body, it was clearly not John. On February 3, 2008, a hunter found the remains of John Bryant in a forest in Macon County, Georgia. A couple of months earlier, on December 1, 2007, a 46-year-old Florida resident named Cheryl Dunlap failed to show up at a dinner with friends and missed church the next day. She was reported missing on December 3, the same day her white Toyota Camry was found abandoned near a forest. The right rear tire had been punctured with what the police believed was a bayonet. Cheryl's bank card had been used to make several ATM withdrawals in Tallahassee from December 2 to December 4. An unidentified man could be seen on surveillance video making the withdrawals. He was wearing a mask made of tape. On December 15, a hunter in the Apalachicola National Forest 
notified the authorities after finding the body of a woman. DNA testing identified the body as Cheryl Dunlap. Her head and hands were missing. They were found less than a month later, about seven miles away. Several witnesses saw Gary Michael Hilton around the time of Cheryl's disappearance. He was driving a white Chevrolet Astro van. At one point, Gary was seen rummaging through a white Toyota Camry, the same type of vehicle owned by Cheryl. The police were unable to locate Gary. On January 1, 2008, a 24-year-old Georgia resident named Meredith Emerson took her dog Ella for a hike on Blood Mountain. This is the highest peak on the Georgia section of the Appalachian Trail. Meredith never returned from her hike, and there was no sign of her dog either. She was reported missing on January 2. The police searched for her unsuccessfully, but they did find items that belonged to her, like a dog leash, dog treats, and water bottles. They also found an extendable baton next to her items, like the kind used by police officers. The police spoke to several witnesses who had spotted a creepy man walking a dog on the trail. The man had talked to people and indicated that the name of his dog was Dandy. Witnesses described the man as being unusual in many ways, including how he had an extendable baton on his belt. A white Chevrolet Astro van had been spotted in a parking area at the trailhead. On January 3, Gary's former employer notified the police and told them that he thought the man they were looking for was Gary Michael Hilton. The former employer said that Gary called him and asked for money. He left it at an office as per Gary's instructions as a SWAT team waited for Gary to show up, but he never did. On January 4, Meredith's dog Ella was found in a parking lot for a Kroger supermarket. After this, the police received anonymous tips indicating that Gary was at a Chevron gas station north of Atlanta cleaning out his van. He was arrested there without incident. Officers discovered that the seatbelt was missing from the back of Gary's van. It matched a seatbelt found in a convenience store dumpster along with Meredith's wallet, driver's license, and clothing. Blood was found in the van. The DNA matched Meredith. Initially, Gary would not talk to the police. After he was offered a plea bargain, taking the death penalty off the table, he confessed. Gary said that he had kidnapped Meredith on the trail on January 1. On January 4, the same day he was arrested, he killed Meredith with a tire iron before decapitating her, stating that the murder was difficult because they had spent several good days together. Gary said that he couldn't bring himself to kill her dog. The police found Meredith's body in the Dawson Forest after Gary revealed the location. On January 30, 2008, Gary Hilton pleaded guilty to murder and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. In October 2009, the state of Florida charged Gary in connection with the murder of Cheryl Dunlap. In 2011, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. In 2012, Gary pleaded guilty to federal charges for murdering John and Irene Bryant. He was sentenced to a term of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Gary had many different experiences with people which may reveal information about his personality. For example, people who encountered Gary immediately knew that there was something frightening about him. They may not have been able to identify exactly what it was, but they sensed danger. Gary was described by many as creepy, this is an adjective that was used repeatedly by people who encountered him under a variety of circumstances. It probably didn't help Gary that he would often mumble to himself. Gary appeared to have anger management difficulties, although he often used indirect threats, which helped him to avoid being arrested after confrontations. Gary had adopted unusual strategies as far as interacting with people when he was walking on a trail. He had the tendency of following women and staring at them intensely. If he was not interested in dealing with someone, he would go out of his way to avoid them, sometimes even walking off the trail. Gary was fascinated with weapons. He often carried an extendable baton and told people he knew how to use it. He also carried knives, cans of mace, and pellet guns. Due to being a convicted felon, 
ownership of a real firearm was prohibited. It appears as though Gary was always hunting for his next victim. This often involved asking bizarre and invasive questions, like he would ask women hiking on trails if they had a cell phone and if they were alone. There's the sense that he was one step away from just plain asking them if they wanted to be murdered today. Gary also had a habit of asking people to give him assistance, but many people refused. This was probably because of the creepy part. Gary once told a woman that she looked like Cheryl Dunlap, who of course Gary had murdered. It was not unusual for Gary to wear expensive hiking gear, but also to have duct tape on his shoes. One time, not long before the murders of John and Irene Bryant, when Gary was in the Pisgah National Forest, a person saw him at the back of his van unloading it. Gary struck this individual as so disturbing, the person actually took a photograph of him thinking it might have some investigative value later. As it turns out, the individual was correct. Item number two. As I mentioned, Gary was employed from 1997 to 2007. His former employer, who is the one who identified him to the police in Georgia, had a lot to say about his experiences with Gary. For example, at first, Gary was a good employee, a hard worker, charismatic, and easy to get along with. Over time, Gary started behaving in a bizarre fashion. For example, he said that he pulled out several of his own teeth with a pair of pliers and enjoyed the new look because it frightened people. Eventually, Gary became belligerent, combative, volatile, and threatening. Item number three. Early in Gary's criminal career, he committed several low-level offenses. He was represented by an attorney, and they sort of became friends. This attorney described Gary as charming and articulate. I talked about how Gary had been in a low-budget movie in 1995. This movie was titled Deadly Run, and it was produced by the attorney. It was about a serial killer who chased women in the woods. Gary became very excited about the topic and worked on the movie as a consultant. According to the attorney, he knew a lot about serial killers. One of the locations in the movie was a cabin near Blood Mountain. The possible connection to Gary's behavior is the only thing that makes the movie even remotely interesting. It never would have been confused with a good movie, or even a movie that would not cause bad acting-induced nausea. The film was described as direct-to-video, but a more appropriate designation would have been direct-to-trash. Item number four, Gary was convicted of four murders, but he was also investigated in connection with at least five unsolved murders dating back to 1997. It is reasonable to believe that Gary did not begin his homicidal career in October 2007 when he was just shy of 61 years old. I think he probably started many years earlier, but managed to avoid getting caught. In June 2008, when Gary was being transported from Georgia to Florida by the authorities, he talked for the entire trip, and his voice was recorded. He implied that it would have been very unusual for him to start committing murders as late in life as he did. The homicidal behavior was attributed to him losing his mind for a little bit and being unable to get a grip. Now moving to item number five. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Gary exhibited antisocial traits from a young age. Like many people with those traits, he used them to illegally obtain money. His people skills made him good at manipulation, which facilitated his career as a small-time con artist. At some point, he was no longer satisfied, which is stealing. Gary wanted to be a serial killer. He didn't start killing because he needed money. He could have made more money committing other types of crimes. The homicides occurred because that's exactly what Gary wanted. As he progressed into violent activity, he became increasingly bizarre and erratic. This may have been caused by the progression of some type of mental illness, but there's no way to know for sure. His behavior was more organized than would be expected if he had schizophrenia. Maybe his problems were more related to personality pathology, like he was antisocial, narcissistic, and had magical thinking. One thing is for certain, it was obvious to people that something was wrong with Gary. He did not have a good disguise as a serial killer. Rather, he practically checked every box for what people expect 
from a homicidal offender. This decreased his ability to manipulate and forced him to work harder to find victims. Gary had the most success concealing his true nature with people who focused more on the fact that he had a dog with him. Essentially, he used his dog to conceal his creepiness. But as it turns out, there are limits to the social advantages imparted by having a dog. No dog, no matter how gregarious, could conceal the overwhelming creepy power of Gary Michael Hilton. Even a whole pack of dogs would have been insufficient for this task. Those are my thoughts on the case of Gary Michael Hilton. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.